Good afternoon, guys. It's Dr. Mo, and welcome to episode five of the Patient Side podcast. We have actually renamed this podcast. Originally, it was the Nick and Mo Show and the Nick and Mo Talk Telehealth, and then we separated that. So that's the provider side. This is the Patient Side podcast. So we decided to call it the Patient Side podcast. So today we are going to talk to you about uh, prior authorizations, kind of the logistics behind it. Almost every provider will do prior authorizations. We have heard from some family doctors or patients who went to their family doctor and said, hey, can you do this prior authorization for a GLP-1? And they were actually told, we don't have the staff for that. So I'm going to tell you my side and the way we do things at AMS, which is amstelehealth.com. Uh, Nikki and I are not in, pro- in practice together. I'm here with Nikki Baldwin, who I always am. Um, we are not in practice together. We work side by side and push each other to be better. So in our practice at AMS at active medical solutions, um, we do charge extra for prior authorizations because we have to hire staff to do those. We do not bundle our care like a traditional medical practice and submit to insurance. We do not use insurance. Neither of us do. Um, we don't take insurance for medical care, but we will work on prior authorizations for medication coverage. So that's kind of what today's going to be about. I'm going to kick it off to Nikki to go through um, all that prior authorization information. Thanks. So there has been, um, I mean, we've been doing both of our practices. We've been doing prior auths for a really long time, but it seems like there has definitely been an uptick in the amount of prior auths. And because both of our practices augment primary care, we may not have um, all the information that we need to submit a prior auth. So what is a prior auth? So prior authorization is a, is something that the your insurance company may require for a coverage of a medication, pretty much explaining why we as prescribers feel like we need your, we want you on this medication, how it's going to benefit you, why you're going to be on it, how long you're going to be on it. They want, okay, more information, right? Because truth be told, they just don't want to cover it. But if we do the extra legwork, which it's, it, it can be very time consuming, sometimes we can get it approved. Um, now, sometimes insurances are just stubborn and it doesn't matter what you do. They're not going to cover it. doesn't matter. We can write a novel. They don't care. Other times they just want a few, a few pieces of information. There's no way for us to know that until we get into the prior off for your specific insurance. So everyone's insurance is so different. Um, each plan is different. Everything is so different. So there's, there's no one cookie cutter way to get an approval because that's just not how insurance works. So there's a couple things that you guys can do to help us help you because we augment primary care and support the primary care. We don't have all of that data that the primary care has. We don't have a, maybe don't have an A1C trend for the last you know year. We maybe don't have um, your, your, your lipid panel. So it is important that when we do a prior auth, you give us a lot of your information and that you're really thorough on your medical history. That's important anyway, because if I'm treating you for something and I give you, let's say an antibiotic for some, for like a sinus infection, if I don't know what medications you're on daily, whether it's blood pressure or blood thinner or um, something for cholesterol. I need to know if those interact, right? So that's super important anyway, but I need to, we need to make sure that, that you understand as patients that we need the information so that we can go to bat for you, because really that's what the prior auth is. How can we plead your case, right? So we can only plead what we know, right? So there's a couple different ways to initiate a prior auth. The pharmacy can initiate it and then it will kick it to us. Sometimes we can, and sometimes we can just start them on our own. When we initiate a prior auth on our own as a practice for a medication, let's just use ZepBound, for example, we need, we do need a picture of your insurance card with the RX VIN, the RX PCN number and the group number. And that's so we can create so that the, the actual website that we use will recognize you as having coverage. So with that, that's how we initiate it. And then it's going to ask us questions. And sometimes it's 20 questions and sometimes it's five. We never know until we get in there. But we always want to make sure, number one, that we have factual information to back up everything. Because I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for me and Dr. Mo, we do not want to be sharing a jail cell with a patient because we put down that they were diabetic 
when we did not have information to back that up because I have been asked over and over over the last couple of years, can you just put that diagnosis? No, that's insurance fraud. So let's just lay that right there out. Okay, <laughs> I'm not I'm not committing insurance fraud remotely and ne neither is Dr. Mo. So if you ask that, we won't do it. Um, but anyway, so it is important They're out there that we have information to back that up. If I get a patient that comes in and they want ZEP bound because they can't get into their primary, if I do a prior off, I need to know all of your medical history. So what is your current height and weight? Are you continuating therapy? Is this going to be initiating therapy? How long have you struggled with your weight? These are all questions. Has the patient tried and failed XYZ, conservative therapy, diet and exercise? Um, you know, what have you tried to manage in the last, to, to manage your weight in the last six months, diet, exercise, have you been to Weight Watchers? Did you go to the gym? I don't care if you went one time. If you went to the gym, then I can legally say you went to the gym. I'm not trying to be um, elusive here, but we need all of your information. If you, uh, we've all tried diet and exercise. We've all tried, inter, you know, intermittent fasting or whatever, whatever different plan, keto, something, right? We've all done several things. So tell me about that because it's going to ask what has the patient tried? And I need to know the patient has tried and failed this, right? And so then like, okay, now we can try. Sometimes your insurance will say, I want you to go on this other medication for six months, or you have to try conservative measures for at least six months, or you have to have be in some sort of diet plan, like Weight Watchers or Noom or something like that. Like you, you have to do that. And so if we know that, let's say last year you did Weight Watchers, then tell us about that. If it was two years ago, tell us about that because we can plead your case. So another thing is, you know, have you ever had any counseling sessions with your provider related to weight with a dietitian, with your primary care? Have they ever discussed weight loss with you? Have they ever discussed the comorbidities that come with obesity? that kind of thing. So those are all things that we need to know. No matter how minute they are, if you give us more information, we'll take what we need. But when you don't give us all the information that we need, because you just don't know, which is why we're here, telling you what is helpful to get that prior authorization approved. Sometimes, no matter what we do, we're not going to get it approved because it's just the nature of insurance, right? Sometimes they cover stuff and sometimes they don't. Um, but it's just important. So we're going to want to know current height and weight. What have you struggled with? How long have you struggled with it? Has it been your whole life? Has it been the last two years since you started menopause? Has it been since you stopped smoking a decade ago? So give us more, more meat so that we have more information to plead your case. We want to know what products you've, you've started. Have you done over-the-counter weight? Have you done um, over-the-counter weight loss pills? Have you, you know, anything like that? We, we, we want to know that. And then what are you doing now to manage your weight? So give us, give us some information there. Another thing that we, we do need to know is if your BMI falls below um, 30, which is like 27.0 to 29.9, most insurance companies, if they're going to cover you, like to have a comorbidity. What does that mean? They say that if you're not in the obese range, but you're overweight, we want you to have one comorbidity as well. Now that could be high blood pressure. Okay, so you're probably on something for blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, any kind of heart disease. Are you a binge eater? Are you, there's tons of things. So there's, it's really like, what kind of conditions do you currently have? And how can, how does that relate to your obesity, right? We all know that obesity comes with a stretch of things, right? And in the early stages of, of obesity, maybe you don't have diabetes but eventually it will turn into that, right? A lot of times it does, not always, but a lot of times it does. Sometimes things are genetic with cholesterol. Sometimes things are obesity related. So give us all of that information. And if you have a recent A1C level, we would love to see those results that have been um, with your primary. Um, the A1C is the definitive diagnosis for type two diabetes. And we are going to need that to be able to put down that you are type two di diabetes. Um, you're probably going to be on metformin or you're already going to be on other medications, but we're going to need factual information to back that up because when they come back and say, you know, we need additional data, please send them, then send the patient's chart. We need to be able to, to provide that. So we are trying our best on our end. We both have prior authorization specialists. We both have a team that does it because it's so involved. 
it, it, it could take 10 or 15 minutes or it could take an hour. Some of them may have to be called in. They can't be, they can't be done electronically. And sometimes there's, a, there's you know, even little things that there's a married name or a name discrepancy or a birth date discrepancy. It's, it's a whole can of worms. And so it, accuracy is super important, but it's, we're, we're, we're making this video because there is a lot of requests for these prior offs and we do charge extra for these because it takes specific staff to do it specifically trained staff. So it takes time and effort and it's very frustrating for patients. And I, I understand when we go through all of this and we're pulling all this data from you and you know, it, it gets to be a pain, but when we get it, we submit it and they still say no. And that's frustrating because you've essentially spent money for us to do it and still got a denial. So while we understand that, we have no control over what your insurance company will cover or won't cover, or if this or if that, but sometimes they require things that we just can't prove. And that's why we rely on you as the patient to give us that supporting documentation. So now a lot of primary cares, and even if you've been recently to the hospital, you have online database to all of your health records. And that's a great way for you to send the information to us, upload them into your chart, send them to us so that we can review things on a larger scale and have some sort of better picture of how you are struggling with your weight and with the comorbidities that come with that. So, um, that's really everything I have on that as far as prior authorizations. They're tedious. They're a pain for us. They're a pain for you. They're a pain for everybody involved. But we really do try to work with your insurance to figure out, okay, what do we need and what can we prove legally within the guidelines, within the standard of care, within the prior authorization guidelines to help you get this approved. And just understand that sometimes it's still a no. So you really have to weigh is spending the money on a prior off and it, it's it's I think it's around fifty dollars or so for us to do it. I don't I don't know what Dr. Mo charges, but for for me, I think we charge seventy five. Okay, so it, that's very and that's very very competitive. So. Some charge one hundred fifty. Yeah, My old provider did. Yeah, yeah. Some of the colleagues that I have, they just charge the charge ninety nine dollars. Period. You know, period. And so we're actually lower than normal, I guess. But um, which is good because it, it you know, I don't just want to, and Dr. Mo doesn't either, we don't just want to take your money and, you know, whatever. Yeah. And we also do one appeal for that as well. Um, we will do one appeal that's kind of included in there, but we always tell patients, please call your insurance company and ask them because people say, oh, it's approved with the PA. Ask them what the criteria are are for approval with the prior authorization. Because if you call and ask them and you ask them, what are the conditions? Is there step therapy required? Because sometimes they'll require step therapy that's just as expensive as the medication we're asking for. So if they say, oh, you have to take Trulicity first. Okay. Then the question is, do you require a prior authorization for Trulicity? Because it's the same class. So you may need to do a second prior authorization for the step therapy drug. So that's what you need to know. Because if you're going to be paying $150 for prior authorizations to get a drug, you may be better served paying that amount of money and going a different route that you're, if you're comfortable with compounded, going that route. Yeah. So, so I don't do appeals at all. I, the, the patient can appeal it themselves. And so that's what we have them do because appeals are just like, I just, I don't have the bandwidth to do that, but Dr. Mo does them. And that's great. I'm, I'm actually glad to hear that you do them because I, I don't, I don't know anyone else that actually does them. So go to her if you think you're going to need an appeal. Cause she, she definitely, she, she, she does, that does give you one appeal. We will resubmit it. If something is done, like you're like, Oh, I didn't, I forgot to do this, whatever, then we'll resubmit it. But I don't, I don't generally do, do appeals. We plead your case very well. Um, and after that, it's really, it's really in the, in the, in the patient's hand in the insurance, they, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Um, but you know, we, we try to, both of us try to turn them over pretty rapidly, as long as we have all the information that we need. And some of the stuff that we're asking for, it may seem silly, but we're just asking you what they're asking us. So we're trying to, we're trying to get this information for you. Um, in other words, the all FDA all approved, um, drugs for obesity and weight loss they will want to see if you are at maintenance, they will want to see a 5% or more weight loss within three months. Mm -hmm. That's what they consider success. 
So if you're not, if you haven't gotten there yet, they may not approve. Yeah. And you can't just call your insurance and say, do you approve Manjaro? Do you cover Manjaro? They will tell you yes, but do you cover it for weight loss? No. See, they will. We, we cover it, but we want the type two diabetes diagnosis. Right. Or, but so I'm pre-diabetic. The the patient say, my insurance said they'll cover it. Great. And then they get denied. And then they're upset with us. Correct. Because- I paid you $75 and I still got denied. We actually had to put on the invoicing, you know, the prior authorization submission does not guarantee approval. We require you call your insurance company first to ask for clinical criteria for approval. We've had insurance reps that will not tell the patient what it is. Call back. Yeah. Yeah. They won't. They won't. So it is important for you to call your insurance to say, number one, if you don't cover what X, Y, Z, what do you cover in that place? Do you require a prior auth? And what is the criteria? Because if you say, okay, great, you cover Manjaro, what's the criteria? Well, our criteria is type two diabetes diagnosis. Okay, then for me, you don't cover it, right? But they're not gonna be forthcoming always with you with because they don't know what you're looking for it for. They just say, do you cover it? Yeah, we do. But we cover it if X, Y, Z. and if X, Y, Z. So there's, there's, and you've taken low- metformin, glyburide, trulicity and Manjaro, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, yeah. 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 And sometimes every once in a while we'll send some and it will get approved with no questions asked and some, and there is some unicorn insurances out there, but they're pretty rare, Yeah, you know? So just, just help us help you. That's really the, 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 the talk and the takeaway of today is help us help you make sure everything is thorough, even no matter how minute it is, give it to us. If we can submit it in with that information, we definitely will. Um, we're just at the mercy of your insurance. So the more, you know, about your insurance and what they'll cover, um, then we can start off on at least a very good foot and have a good idea of, of where to go. Agreed. Because if there, if you have an insurance company that does not offer obesity medicine coverage period under any circumstances with a, with a a prior authorization, just because your pharmacy said, Oh, you need a prior authorization for this. It, that doesn't mean it's going to be covered. If they don't have any obesity medication coverage, it, it doesn't matter what we say, how much we beg there there. It's, it's not even, it's, I don't even know if they're human or AI, to be honest. I feel like that happens a lot. We get patients to say, oh, the pharmacy just said to fill out a prior auth and it'll be covered. The doctor just needs to authorize it. That's my favorite. The doctor needs to authorize it. No, I need to prescribe it. It's the insurance company that's asking for the authorization, which isn't from me. It's from the insurance company. I already told them I need you to take the drug. That part's easy. They're questioning us on why, right? Yes, that's exactly what that is. Already annoying, but- they're questioning us on why. So it's not just a click a button and sign it. It's authorized. No, we, we have already authorized it because we prescribed it. We are prescribers. We are, have nothing to do with the medication, how much it costs once it gets to the pharmacy, what your insurance covers, nothing. We are only the prescribers. Just doing the right thing. That's all we do. Hanging out and doing the right thing. That's it. So, I mean, that's uh, it's a lot on prior authorizations (laughs) for sure. Um, and it, and it does feel like, why do I have to do all this work? Well, you don't have to, we have options if you don't want to go through insurance at all, which is why we both offer that option. Not everybody's comfortable with that. No, not everybody's line. And I'm okay with that too. You know, or if you want to go use the ZepBound coupon, you do have insurance for you. Like, I don't want to call the insurance. I'm just going to use a coupon and I'll pay 550. Fine. I like, we, we don't push people a certain way because we make more money. We get, we don't get kickbacks. Like the, we don't, yeah, that's, that's illegal. You can't like period. End of story. That's why I actually, I use that word intentionally too, when I'm doing lives or I'm talking about why do you send people to Nikki Baldwin? I'm like, well, cause I like her and I respect her. Uh, we don't get kickbacks. We don't, you know, like I said, we work alongside each other. We have two different medical practices. We do things differently, very differently. That's a couple of our other podcasts. And we go forward. We push each other forward. We do things. Um, we, we don't, we are not in practice together. 
Uh, well, I shouldn't say that because by teaching, we are we teaching providers. We do collaborate. collaborate. Yes, collaborate. We, we do. And we're teaching providers to form private practices to take better care of their patients virtually. So that is something that we are going into together. But as far as patient care, we do not do things together. We do things very differently. Yeah, we do. I mean, there is, there's more than one way to skin a cat. We definitely do things different ways. She, she, she does appeals and I will do, um, I don't know. I don't know if you do this. Do you, so if a patient, so really quick, before we wrap this up, if a patient comes in and they want, let's say a prescription for medicine A and they say, okay, well, I need a prior off. And then they say, okay, well, the prior off was denied, but my insurance will cover B, but they need a prior off. Do you charge them for the second prior off? I typically don't. I typically do not. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I yeah. If they said, no, go this drug. It needs a prior off because it's mm-hmm. all the same information we just collected. Right. So we'll yeah. usually just ship it through. At least if it's in the same year, because things change. And so you have to update right. things and different things like that. That's required for you to like proceed through the, through the actual process. But if you, if you need more than one prior off, we don't just keep charging you. Um, but that is uh, pretty much the skinny on uh, prior authorizations. To reach me, go to mytelehealthconnect.com. And for Dr. Mo, it is amstelehealth.com. All right. So we'll see you, um, see you next time. And hope you guys have a great, uh, great New Year's. Yes. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.